I'm doing it now. Hello. If you're here for the webinar discussing Zohat, the work of Zohat in um, Israel-Palestine, you're at the right spot. We are going to be um, starting in just a few minutes. I've now um, allowed people to enter. I see members are coming in. My name is Peter Larson. I'm the chair of the Ottawa Forum on Israel-Palestine. And this is a joint event that I'll be doing with the uh, uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. And I'm had, happy to have here with me, Michael Buchard. Michael, say hello to our guests as well. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Michael, the vice president of CJPME, a national advocacy organization based in Montreal, and very happy to have everyone joining us today. Terrific. In just a minute, I'm going to turn on my, uh, uh, do a very short um, PowerPoint presentation, introducing the topic and introducing the people, and then we'll get into uh, um, the, th the thick of the um, presentation itself. So, share screen from the beginning. So, as I say, um, this is a special NACPA event. This is the 75th anniversary of the NACPA, which in, in some ways was a long time ago, but in some ways continues uh, to, to this day. It's a special event uh, in aid of um, a is, is an organization in Israel-Palestine called Zohot. Um, I'm going to tell you a second about uh, uh, in, uh, a few things about Zohot in a minute. And the two people who are going to, we're going to be talking to are Umar Al-Khobari and Rachel Bittari, who are employees, work with uh, Zohot. And as I said before, this is a joint event that is co-organized by OFEP and by CJPME. And uh, Zohot uh, launched a crowdfunding campaign and I offered to them to organize a webinar so they could bring their message to a larger Canadian audience. The agenda today is pretty simple. Uh, this is the welcoming part. Then we'll have a little, tiny bit of background and introductions. Um, then we'll have a discussion. Michael, Michael and I will ask questions of Umar Akubari and uh, Rachel. And then after that, you'll be able to ask questions uh, of them. Uh, I. I've set it up so that the chat function should work all the time. So you can chat, people on the call uh, can chat with each other or send questions into the participants, but we will only be picking up questions that are in the Q&A function. So if you have a direct question you want answered, put it in the Q&A, please. Michael and I will try to keep an eye on that as things unfold, but feel free to make comments or whatever to us or to each other on the chat, chat function, although we'll be paying less attention to that. Um, I draw to your attention that we will end at 2.45, thereabouts, Ottawa time, about 15 minutes. And the next uh, webinar I want to draw your attention to is one where I'm actually debating John Allen, uh, the former Canadian ambassador to Israel, uh, on his idea that there still is a time and hope for a two-state solution. My, um, I, I disagree. And uh, this is being hosted by the Canadian International Council. It's open to anyone. We'll be sending out a notice for anybody who's interested in that. I am so grateful to John, who I have great high respect for, uh, because it's difficult to get um, Zionists to engage in serious public discussion. And so I'm grateful to him for agreeing to do that. So briefly, what is Zohad? Um, I'll tell you what I think, and then uh, our guests can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Zohat is an, uh, an NGO that's registered in Israel. Their um, offices are in Jaffa. They work primarily to disseminate historical information about the Palestinian Nakba in Hebrew. So Zohat is quite different from your traditional human rights organizations that might be fighting for prisoners' rights or children's rights or land or whatever. They are principally an educational organization, and they promote accountability for the Nakba amongst the Jewish public is spelled wrong, Jewish public of, of, of Israel. And particularly, they're focused on uh, how to envisage the implementation of the right of return for Palestinian refugees. The two people we have today to talk about Zohat are Rachel Bittari, who is the director. She has a degree from Tel Aviv University. She was um, active as uh, the co-founder of PSEE, an independent feminist media organization. She worked as media coordinator at Gisha, the legal center for free movement, which 
was largely focused on the rights of Palestinians moving in and out of Gaza. She previously worked in Beijing as a reporter covering human rights and political and social issues in China, and she currently lives in Jaffa. Uh, her partner here for today is uh, Omar al Gubari. He is a Palestinian educator and group facilitator. He was previously coordinator of the youth department in the School for Peace in Nevi Shalom. He has 20 years of experience in social education for elementary school students. He's born in the Palestinian village of Mush, help me, uh, Mush, Sherfa, whose um, residents avoided expulsion during the Nakba. So they became citizens of Israel, unlike many of the refugees who didn't have that opportunity. Um, so I'll ask them to um, um, turn on their videos. And I'll just point out the last thing I wanted to show you here is that when we do um, webinars, uh, we normally, uh, at the end of it, at, remind people that OFIP is a volunteer, not-for-profit organization. We make a, we rattle our tin cup a little bit and ask people if they would like to make contributions, um, which they often do and for which we are eternally grateful. However, today, um, this is all about uh, Zohar and its crowdfunding campaign. And so any contributions that are made today will go, uh, if you, either if you send them to us or if you put them directly, I will, in the follow-up email, I'll include their button so you can make a donation directly to them. So there you go. And welcome, Umar. And welcome, uh, Rachel. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Umar, you're in the middle of Ramadan. So we appreciate um, your fitting us into your, your agenda. Thank you for the two of them. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting. Um, almost at the end of Ramadan. It's just almost like three, four day, days, and it will be changed. Right. Okay. And Rachel, thank you for joining us uh, as well. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, why don't we get right into it? And um, Michael, why don't you start off by um, um, seeing what we can learn in the next hour and a bit about uh, Zohar, what it's doing, and so on. Michael. Sure. So. I'm familiar with the organization, but many on this webinar uh, might not have heard of you before. I think maybe it's it's worth starting with a bit of an overview. What it, what is the objective of Zakrat? Um, perhaps that means uh, talking a little bit about you know what exactly is the Nakba, um, but also what do you see as your vision for a new Israel Palestine? Well, thank you again for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to uh, talk about this uh, uh, issue. Um, yeah, we are running now activities around the 75th years of, uh, of the Nakba. And uh, it's quite important to talk about the Nakba in many circles. And of course, in the land of the Nakba, in, the, in, in Palestine, in the Israeli context, in the Israeli Jewish society. So Zohrot was founded, uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, in 2002 as um, an organization that um, aims to challenge the Israeli Jewish perceptions about the Palestinian Nakba and the history of 1948, uh, from the uh, understanding that most of the Israeli Jewish people grow up in this country without knowing what really happened to the Palestinian people. They grow up with the the Zionist Israeli myths about the empty land or the, the, the Arabs just left by their own or um, uh, uh, different um, uh, myths without uh, talking about the real issue. Even those that are willing to talk about a kind of uh, solution or reconciliation or peace uh, don't really touch the source of the relationship or the power relation between the Israeli uh, society and the Palestinian people because they are willing to talk about kind of solution regarding the occupation in the West Bank, but not talking about the real catastrophe that started in 1948. So Zohrot uh, is doing uh, um, um, its best to uh, explore and to expose the history of the Nakba, mainly in Hebrew, uh, to translate from Arabic testimonies of Palestinian refugees to uh, collect uh, information and uh, create a database in Hebrew uh, for those that are still interested to learn about the history of the Palestinian people or, or as we try to 
deliver that the history of their own. It's not only the history of the Palestinians, it's the history of the, of the Israelis, it's, it's the history of uh, the Zionists uh, um, um, as a side that created or did the Nakba to the, uh, to the Palestinians. So it's also part of their history uh, that they should uh, know and should face. Um, so this is the, 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 the main goal is to let people know about the Nakba. We bring the information, deliver the information in different tools by our rich ops, uh, website, by uh, uh, a very interesting app that called iReturn, uh, by organizing open tours for people that are interested to walk and to tour and to see the ruins of the Palestinian destroyed towns and cities and villages. Uh, by organizing courses uh, about the history of the Nakba and about the decolonization of the uh, mindset and the decolonization of the land space, uh, um, um, uh, by uh, conferences uh, uh, and a variety of, uh, of, of activities. Um, um, and um, the next level that we hope to reach with these people that we are in contact with is to acknowledge the responsibility on the Nakba by the Israeli side. And the uh, further stage should be, and we hope it will be, to start the process of uh, repair, the process of redress, the process of correction, uh, which must be based, as we believe, as we believe, on the uh, in making justice with the Palestinian people as the main victim of the Nakba, uh, uh, mainly to acknowledge and to implement the right to return of the Palestinian refugees. We are going to get a little bit more into your activities and further questions. So uh, that was great on the, the uh, uh, objective. Michael, did you get a clear vision? Um, certainly in, in terms of maybe more the immediate future, but what is this awareness leading to? What, um, if this awareness, if these programs are successful, what kind of society uh, do you hope to create? Right, maybe I'll answer this. Um, okay, so um, just to make sure that we are uh, all clear about what the Nakba is, uh, Nakba in Arabic means uh, great disaster or catastrophe. Um, and it refers to the event uh, from 1947 to 1949, the creation of the State of Israel that resulted in the expulsion um, of hundreds of thousands, uh, nearly a million Palestinians from Palestine, and most of them are refugees and stateless to these days, uh, the destruction of hundreds of villages, um, pillage of, of Palestinian uh, property and so on and so forth. Um, and we refer to the Nakba not just as this historical event, but as an ongoing process of decolonization of Palestine. Um, so, uh, and, and when you learn about the Nakba, um, it becomes very easy to see the connection and the linkage uh, between what happened in 1948 or even before and what is happening right now, today, every minute uh, in the West Bank, in Gaza, uh, and inside Israel as well, in East Jerusalem and so forth, uh, because it's the continuation of the same practices and the same ideology um, of colonizing the whole of Palestine uh, for Jewish people only this exclusivity. So our vision is to dismantle this exclusivity. Our vision is um, justice for and redress, as Omar said, for Palestinian refugees, and justice would be the return of any refugees who, who want to wish to return to Palestine, that is rightly theirs. Um, and by that, we don't mean uh, another expulsion, mass expulsion of Jewish people from Palestine. Uh, we believe there is or there will be eventually a room for everyone in this land. Uh, but for that to happen, the system of uh, Jewish supremacy 
uh, the system that from the beginning uh, of the Zionist migration to Palestine, not the Jewish migration, the Zionists, um, uh, uh, so, so to um, empty the country for Jewish use only. Um, and this is really how uh, the Israeli state was built and all of its systems. Uh, so the uh, vision is uh, dismantling this colonial system, decolonization, building of a just equal society uh, where everybody can share this land. This Thanks, is really uh, in a nutshell. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Something I didn't mention before, it uh, might not be obvious to everyone. Uh, Rachel is a Jewish Israeli. They're both citizens of Israel. Uh, Rachel is a Jewish Israeli, and Umar is a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Uh, just, just in case there was any lack of clarity on that to bring forward. So that's a that vision of people living together. And and um, uh, tell me, how, how are you, you almost there now? Where, what is? How do you describe the current situation? And then we're going to talk about um, your activities aimed at getting from here to there. But how do you describe? Um, the current reality that you're living in? Um, well, if, if, you, if you have a holistic look at the situation in Israel-Palestine, um, um, it's, um, it's a picture of uh, disappointment and uh, getting uh, further than uh, our goal. But if you look at the uh, local and the circles that we are active at and how we deliver our activity and uh, projects to the, uh, um, the target audience, which is the Jewish uh, um, Israeli society, uh, I think we, we did kind of progress within the last 20 years. I, uh, I can see even a, a lot of progress. Um, Sorry, did you say a lot of progress or a lack of progress? Didn't you? I said a lot of progress. If you compare that to the uh, uh, to the small uh, organization that called Zohrot, right. uh, by the way, the name Zohrot is in Hebrew, means remembering, and this is the even the female form of remembering verb in in, in Hebrew um, to try just to, by the name also to shape different memory among the among the Israelis because they are used to have uh, militarist and uh, you know, and tough uh, memory and uh, approach. We try by the name of the organization even to change this perception. Um, so I think if, if we compare, for example, the number of the people that were interested in the activity of Zohro 20 years ago with the number of this year or last year, we'll see a huge uh, uh, progress. We, we we meet hundreds of people every year in our different activities, um, and even if we look at the wider uh, uh, circles in the Israeli Hebrew um, uh, discourse, the mentioning of the Nakba 15 years ago or 10 years ago was really very rare in the Israeli uh, uh, media and the Israeli newspapers. In these days, you might find every day an article that mentions the Nakba. Doesn't mean that they acknowledge the Nakba, doesn't mean that they agree with us or, re or realize the Nakba as we do realize, but at least they mention and they talk about it. So in our understanding, the Israeli society cannot anymore avoid the Nakba. Because the discourse was 15 years ago that the Nakba didn't happen. No one did that. And we, but uh, with the ongoing research and the ongoing activity of Zohrot and other figures and other people and other researchers, I think now the picture is people in Israel cannot avoid that it happened. Unfortunately, many of them try to justify why it happened. And, and others uh, try to understand how it happened and what is the uh, uh, responsibility of Israel in, in at least the part of Israel and the responsibility about, about the Nakba. So if we compare the situation in these uh, uh, small points, I think we, we managed to, to make that. But in general, you see and you know uh, how the Israeli society uh, went um, more and more to the right extreme fascist uh, uh, 
um, reality and uh, of course the current government and uh, uh, the whole situation and tense regarding everything is, is, is getting worse. It's not new, but it's getting uh, uh, worse uh, even in the way that this government tried to um, to to make the unjust to implement the unjust the, the injustice and to implement the colonizations also has different or variety of ways and this government tries to do that in the uh, uh, the ugliest way that it could be done in in the Israeli context. So I wonder I, if I could jump in quickly. Uh, it seems to me that there's also this other, associated with this far-right government, there's this other trend in Israeli society, which is not to ignore um, or deny the Nakba, but to say, uh, to threaten a second one. <laughs> uh, and this seems to be something that is fairly common with uh, senior politicians in the, in the current government. Uh, uh, Smotrich, for example, the finance minister, said just a couple years ago, that uh, Palestinians in Israel are here by mistake because Ben Gurion didn't finish the job and throw you out in 1948. Um, therefore, sort of acknowledging that, that that many people were thrown out in 48, but done so in order to uh, to threaten a new new waves of expulsion. Of course, you you mentioned how the Nakba is ongoing, but I think these threats are uh, point to maybe the possibility or the, of eventually a, a larger scale expulsion, or at least maybe larger sort of tolerance at the political level for 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 talking about that kind of activity. What do you make of that trend and how it fits in with the larger sort of, I guess, theme, which is just pretending that the Nakba didn't exist? Well, I think uh, definitely that's the goal of the uh, more extreme faction uh, of, of this government, uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich, uh, the religious Zionists, um, who, and, and the settler movement in, in the West Bank. Um, definitely they would love to see that happen. Um, they want to gather power to, to do that uh, someday. They are, uh, they are not quite there yet. Uh, and they have a lot of followers and, and a lot of Israelis, unfortunately, agree with them uh, that it's so much out in the open, uh, in a way, uh, this uh, ugliness, um, you know, this um, really um, uh, murderous kind of talk um, I guess we can see it as a good thing. Um, but I want to point out to something else that um, the, the denial of the Nakba for decades and the erasure of, the, of any trace of the Nakba um, and, and the erasure of, of Palestinian history and Palestinian identity, that's exactly what led and what allowed uh, this movement uh, to become so powerful, to flourish, uh, to the point that now many Israelis are themselves threatened by it. Um, Sorry, threatened by what? Threatened by? Threatened by, by the settler movement, by the power that uh, people like Smotrich and, and ben Gvir now have. Um, and, and part of the, I would say, semi-awakening uh, in the Israeli uh, public since the um, formation of this government um, uh, is uh, something that should have happened a long time ago um, and something that Zohrot has been advocating since its creation. And of course, many Palestinians and, and Israelis as well have been advocating uh, for much longer than that. Um, so it's very, very late to um, to awake and to start realizing uh, the the foundation of of this regime that is leading to the conclusion of yes another mass expulsion another Nakba and and maybe God forbid even worse. Um, but again, this is a continuation rather than an, an aberration. Yeah. May I just uh, uh, illustrate what Rochelle, Rochelle said uh, right now, because 
um, even we, we hear this really uh, fascist uh, um, uh, desire of Smutrich or Ben Gvir or our ministers, but for us, it's not new. If you are a researcher of the Nakba, you, you hear these uh, desires uh, among the Israeli liberal uh, leadership in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. It's not new, it, it is kind of trend, but people forgot that it was uh, done by the liberal wing of the uh, Zionist movement in 1948 uh, um, and uh, around 1948. And even after the creation of the State of Israel, I'm sharing with you just one document that was published last year by our Israeli organization called Akivot. It's a kind of a statement of Moshe Dayan, who became the defense minister in the 60s in Israel. And he said in one meeting of his party, which was the dominant party in the 50s in, in, in Israel, uh, uh, um, and he said that, I hope that in the coming years, there may be another option to make the, a transfer for those Arabs from the land of Israel. And he meant the Israeli citizens of Israel. He talked in, in the original one in Hebrew, he talked about one 700,000 Palestinians inside Israel. So this desire or this uh, demand of transferring the Palestinians from Israel, even those that they got citizenship, it's not, only Smutrich trend. It was also Moshe Dayan trend in the 50s. Well, may, that's quite uh, an important thing to remember. And I think maybe we can return to some of this discussion later in terms of what are some of the, the, the dangers and challenges in talking about the Nakba and uh, today in Israeli society. Uh, I did want to ask you though about uh, a little bit more about the activities that you undertake. Um, I actually had the opportunity in 2016 to do one of your walking tours in Jaffa uh, and to see um, how to, to learn about how the city was depopulated, how uh, the, you know, the city was demolished and turned into the beach, the beautiful Tel Aviv beach. Uh, and I found that to be quite a, a powerful experience. Um, so I know that walking tours are certainly one aspect of, of the work that you that you do. C can you tell us a little bit more about uh, a, a couple of the activities that you do to try to uh, meet that objective that you are have? Are those walking tours for tourists? Or are they mostly for Israelis that are sort of related to it? Well, the, uh, in the as I said in the beginning, the main goal of Zohrot and also the main goal of the of the tours is to do that for Israelis and to show them the area and the place that they live in. And sometimes they even live very close to a Palestinian uh, uh, ruins or Palestinian mosque or Palestinian cemetery or Palestinian house, but they don't know the real history of that place. And of course, they don't connect that, as we uh, say all the time, with the responsibility of, of the Israeli process of eraser of the other Palestinian uh, uh, places. So mainly it's for Israelis, but sometimes international activists or people that we believe that we will serve the, the goal of Zohot, the interest of Zohot, people that are uh, active in the, in the political field or in the uh, academic field uh, may uh, contact us and maybe we can also make for them um, kind of study tour or learning tour uh, in the in one of the destroyed Palestinian cities. So um, when we started to uh, work in the field, the first thing that we thought about is the best thing is to bring Israelis and to take them to one of the destroyed Palestinian uh, um, uh, places. Sorry, I wanted to share with you just something. Do you see it? We do. Okay. It's not so, it's not maximized though. We're seeing something down the left hand side. It'd be better if it was full screen, I think. That's better, yes. All right. So I um I'm pleased to start, pleased, I'm sorry, <laughs> to start <laughs> with this uh with this slide because it's uh, uh from a park that called Canada Park. 
So please uh, um, say hi to Canada Park. One of the uh, practices that Israel did in, in inside the Green Line, inside the, uh, the State of Israel, uh, um, uh, after it destroyed physically, bulldozed the Palestinian villages, as you can see here in the in this photo, uh, Israel tried to uh, to hide. Uh, in different ways, the ruins of these Palestinian towns that had been already destroyed. So sometimes they planted parks and forests on the top of the Palestinian destroyed places in order to hide them. So if you come as a tourist and you uh, go around the country, you will see very beautiful and green spots and forests. But in fact, if you go inside the forest and look among the trees, you will see the ruins of the crime that uh, had been done uh, over there. So uh, there, there are more than 100 Palestinian villages, for example, are hidden inside these forests. Uh, uh, and by the way, many, many forests following the names of different nations around the world, uh, like Canada, USA, Britain, France, uh, Switzerland, and all other uh, places. But what we say that despite this, brutal process of erasing and hiding the ruins, the Nakba is still there. It cries everywhere. It's If you have good eyes and you ask the correct questions, you will see the Nakba everywhere. But uh, unfortunately, we, we said about the Israeli society that they prefer to, to, to be blind and not to open their eyes and to ask questions about what really is surrounding their houses or their uh, settlements or their uh, uh, towns in, in inside Israel. So if, if you come to Jerusalem through the main road and you look at your left, you will see this is a huge complex of houses of the Palestinian village of Lifta that was expelled in 1948. It's there, it's very clear, and you see the houses. So we see our role is to bring you as an uh, activist or as an Israeli, that lives in this uh, in this area to come and to walk among these houses and to try to see uh, the real story of these houses. They are not houses from the Middle Ages, not from the Roman time. It just till 75 years were populated by Palestinian families that forcibly expelled uh, uh, and uh, their return was blocked uh, and prevented. Uh, this is one more crucial point that we try during the tours to also to talk about that it's not only the uh, the the step of expelling the people, it's also the decision not to allow them to return since 1948 till uh, till today. And this is exactly the uh, the example that uh, Michael mentioned. This is one of the neighborhoods of Jaffa, and this is another way of colonizing and erasing. Uh, 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 a Palestinian um, a community. Uh, on the top on our left, we see the original Palestinian neighborhood of Manshia, one of the Jaffa neighborhoods, and how it was destroyed after 1948. And in the 70s till today, it became part of the promenade of Tel Aviv and became just a beautiful park that called Charles Clore Park and uh, uh, um, touristic area that no one will tell you the real history of this beautiful uh, uh, place. Omar, can, can you go back just for a second on that previous picture, make sure I understand what I'm seeing? It looks like that, if I understand you correctly, this didn't happen during a war. This didn't happen as a result of troops on both sides shooting artillery. How did it happen? Well, in, in the photo that you see destruction, the neighborhood of Manshia was occupied in, in April 1948. By the way, a month before the establishment of the State of Israel, despite the fact that Jaffa is supposed to be part of the Arab country, according to the partition plan, uh, if, 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 if you are interested in that context, but uh, um, one of the uh, uh, Zionist militias attacked the neighborhood of uh, Manshia in as a, the beginning of occupation, the city of Jaffa, because this is the closest neighborhood to Tel Aviv. So it was bombed and uh, shielded from the neighborhoods of Tel Aviv. Part of the houses were destroyed and uh, uh, the Palestinian defender of the, uh, uh, defenders of the neighborhood, they just finished their weapons and they, they, their bullets and they uh, um, 
withdrew and they left the the neighborhood. Then the 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 Irgun uh, members entered the the neighborhood and they passed from house to house. Sometimes they even uh, destroyed the walls uh, of the houses in order to walk inside the inside the uh, in the houses from house to house, and they expelled, if they found people, if they found Palestinian families, they expelled them towards the center of the city of Jaffa that was not occupied yet. It will be occupied in, in the coming days. So the, uh, the, the, all the neighborhood uh, families were actually uh, expelled, and the destruction that we see in the photo, in fact, it was partly by bombing in 1948 in the real days of occupying the, the neighborhood, but many of them were destroyed later on in the months that came after 1948 uh, for many reasons. It, the, the, the main one is just to let the Palestinians understand that they don't have any uh, houses to, to return to. So they destroyed many of these houses. Some of the houses were, were used by uh, Jewish families later on. So the process was a gradual one in erasing this neighborhood, for example. Thank you. It's, you are in mute, Rachel. <clears throat> Can I just jump in and also share something real quick? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm just sharing. Um, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, I'm just sharing it because this photo is from uh, earlier this afternoon, a couple of hours ago, um, in the same place that Omar just uh, described, Manshia neighborhood uh, of Yaffa, now a uh, waterfront park in, in Tel Aviv. Uh, behind us is the um, only house that was left of the neighborhood that is now a museum to the Etzel, the Irgun, uh, fighters that occupied and, and destroyed and depopulated um, and she, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu came there today uh, to pay respect to these uh, war criminals. Um, and these are some activists, Israeli activists that uh, came there to protest, uh, especially recent brutality towards Palestinians in Al-Aqsa and, and in other places. And the sign reads, uh, Manshia Huara. It's not a mistake. It's not an incident. It's a policy. Mm. Um, so uh, I just thought it would be interesting to share. Hawara, of course, is the Palestinian village that was uh, pogromed a few weeks ago that uh, Smotrich said should be wiped out. Um, and this kind of... Um, uh, of action is exactly what we aim to, to push people to do because a few years ago uh, there were always since there was a 67 occupation there were Israelis who resisted it uh, tried to stand in solidarity uh, with Palestinians but it was very rare that they would talk about the events of 1948 or on a fuller context of, of the Nakba they uh, would really separate between the occupied territories and, uh, and Israel in the 48 borders. Um, and now we see more and more, and I'm proud to say uh, a lot of it is due to the work of Zohrot uh, and many years of, of training activists, of, of doing courses and workshops and making um, materials accessible and, and making tools accessible. Uh, we see more and more these connections uh, being more easily done in any level, starting from the Bezalem apartheid report that um, describes all of Israel as an apartheid state from the river to the sea, um, and all the way down to grassroots uh, actions like, like this one that acknowledges the place in, in which they, um, they are being done as a space of Nakba and a space that belongs to Palestinians. So this is really an example of the work that uh, that do, we're trying do, to do. Do any of the Zohar tours include um, older Palestinians who lived in the depopulated locations? 
Absolutely, yeah. I think Omar, you want to. Uh, okay, yeah, maybe I, yes. Um, um, uh, as I started to say, if we uh, look around uh, in, in, in correct eyes, we'll see the Nakba everywhere and the, some of the ruins are still there. And sometimes we find mosques uh, um, in different places around the country. If you don't recognize them as mosques, you will not understand the, the real story of that. But because we are uh, looking for the ruins of the Nakba and, and we are expert of this uh, issue, we just tell the people the, the, the truth. These buildings are actually original mosques in one of the destroyed Palestinian towns. Some of them are used today as museums or uh, just closed building, or even some of them were converted to synagogues, like this case that you see in your right, a uh, synagogue in Nestiona, Israeli city, instead of the Palestinian village of uh, Wadi Hunain. And some uh, churches, abandoned churches, suddenly you see some churches in Shlomi, the Israeli uh, town of Shlomi, or in a mountain that uh, the, the village of Ikrit or the village of Kofor Berahim were located at. All those are um, uh, remain uh, buildings of the Palestinian uh, destroyed uh, villages. Or suddenly in an Israeli neighborhood, or Israeli JNF forest, you see an old building that was used as a school, Palestinian school, uh, before 1948, and these days they are used as uh, uh, office for the JNF, for example, in the photo in our left, or as a branch of the uh, Chabad, the Jewish Orthodox movement, and a synagogue in the village of Der Yassin, which is Givat Sha'ul neighborhood in Jerusalem in these, in these days. When we talk about 600 Palestinian villages and towns that had been erased and destroyed, we ask where are the cemeteries of these places? All of them had cemeteries before 1948. Unfortunately, some dozens of these cemeteries are still uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the landscape. We can find the ruins of them. Many of them are destroyed, uh, desecrated, uh, 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 vandalized in, in, different, in different ways. Some of them just uh, disappeared because the authorities or the government built some uh, buildings or uh, parks or uh, car parkings on, on the top of the Palestinian uh, cemeteries, sometimes even in very brutal, ironic way. They built um, uh, student houses at the University of Tel Aviv, for example, or the Museum of Tolerance in West Jerusalem was built on a cemetery of the Palestinian neighborhood of uh, Manila in, in, in West Jerusalem. But sometimes you can see also very beautiful villas and buildings. They also belong to Palestinian families, not only this destruction. This beautiful villa that called Harun al-Rashid Villa in West Jerusalem, Talbiya neighborhood, uh, was for the family of Bisharat. Uh, the house on your right was for Mr. Arif al-Arif, the mayor of the city of Bir al-Sabi, Bir Sheva in the south of Palestine. And these buildings are in Tiberias for the family of Khartabil. All of them are refugees and no one had the opportunity and the, uh, 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 the implementation of their rights to take um, the, uh, the property back or to, get, or to return to, the, to these houses. Regarding your question, uh, uh, Peter, yes, of course, every research that we do in, uh, about a Palestinian destroyed village or town, starts with Palestinian original family that used to live in that place. Till the, um, I think till three years ago, we interviewed for all the locations that we researched. We researched about 65 different Palestinian towns and villages, and we interviewed at least one Palestinian old man or old woman from, uh, uh, from uh, these places, and these are examples of the people that we interviewed in order to understand the reality and the life before 1948 and the conditions of the expulsion of these uh, families and these places. And we, uh, according to the testimonies of these people, we wrote booklets, we translated the testimony to Hebrew, and we published booklets about these destroyed places. So Zohrot became the main uh, uh, source in Hebrew for people that are interested to read about the Nakba in Hebrew for the Israeli 
uh, uh, researchers or students or just uh, uh, simple people that are curious to read about the Nakba in Hebrew. So the, the question is yes, we, we, we use, we, we, we got help from the Palestinian old people. And when we come to the tour, the first time we, we come to the tour, there will be our guides. Mm. The old Palestinian man or woman that uh, uh, used to live at that place uh, come with us in the first public tour uh, uh, and uh, actually explain to the people where they used to live, how they lived, and how had been expelled. We try also to revive the place by putting signs with the original uh, uh, Palestinian name of the place, as you know, and you can assume that all the names of these Palestinian places was also erased from the landscape, from uh, our knowledge, from the books, from the maps. And as a resistance work, we published maps or counter maps that actually bring the real names of these places. We take the, or the, the current Israeli maps and we put on them the locations and the names of the Palestinian destroyed uh, villages in order to let people realize and to know and learn the names of these places and how many places uh, um, used to be existing in this area. For example, on the map in your left, it's in Hebrew, but uh, it includes 600 names of non-existing Palestinian towns and villages. And they are available in Hebrew in uh, different ways, in, in paper maps, in our website, and in the app that I mentioned in the beginning that called iReturn. iReturn app has in three languages, English, Hebrew, and Arabic, the whole names of the destroyed Palestinian uh, towns and villages, and you can read about it. And also you can use this app as a GPS. You ask the app to take you to the exact location of this destroyed place that, as it was before 1948, because now in the, uh, um, new structures and new buildings and new Israeli uh, uh, settlements and towns, you will not find the location. You need the exact location as it was in the British maps. So this app is based on the British maps as they were before 1948. Sorry if it was long, but I can see. Oh, that was terrific. Thank you. Lots of activity. Um, maybe I'll just go on to... Um, some of the challenges you face in doing this. You, uh, one of the questions is your, your, your theme is remembrance, but of course the, the Zionist um, remembrance is their main theme. I mean, there's a, at least in Canada, it's a continuous talk about the Holocaust. Uh, do, do you find that the remembrance uh, message is uh, competing with the, uh, the Zionist um, Remembrance message, or how, how how does that play in your in your work? Um, yeah, it it meant to be uh, countering uh, the Zionist way of remembrance that is very selective, um, militaristic, um, masculine. Um, that's why zochot in Hebrew is in the female form because we are a feminist movement. Um, and we uh, suggest a memory that is inclusive. Um, remember all the history and that part of the history. Um, and, uh, and, and we build on a very long, uh, both uh, Muslim, but especially Jewish tradition uh, of uh, remembrance. Memories is very uh, central to Jewish tradition before Zionism. Uh, I think the Zionist movement and especially the state of Israel um, is weaponizing um, this tradition and the memory of the Holocaust uh, more and more every year um, in a way that I find really objectionable and, and horrific. And I'm, I'm not talking so much as uh, the director of Zohrot now and, and as an activist, so much as a descendant of, of Holocaust survivors and a daughter of a refugee myself. Um, 
I think what was uh, done to our communities uh, in, in Europe by Nazi Germany um, is something that of course we, we must remember and we must learn the lesson of um, objecting this hierarchy of human value, human lives, um, the separation between different communities, this dehumanization uh, of whole people, uh, whole race or whole, whole uh, religion or community. Um, this is something that we should never allow, but unfortunately this is um, what Israel is doing right now and has been doing for decades uh, to, to the Palestinian. The Palestinians. So, uh, so to, to weaponize this memory uh, at one point and to completely tarnish it, um, on the other hand, uh, that I think should enrage anyone with a conscience. And it, I know it enrages me uh, as someone who, who carries this, uh, this memory and this generational trauma. Michael, do you want to um, pick up on that? Or I guess I mentioned it, uh, without jumping in, uh, I'll, I'll do one more and Michael, you can. Um, what kind of pushback do you get from Palestinian society? Um, we here in Canada, I don't think we have a very clear notion of the whole no normalization kind of stuff, which kind of gets translated here a little bit like you shouldn't talk to you shouldn't talk to Jews or you shouldn't talk to Israelis or whatever, but do you face any pushback in terms of the work you're doing, which is aimed at educating the oppressor, um, basically? Well, um, yeah, it's a very interesting point. Um, of course, in the uh, among Palestinian activists that don't know Zohrot and the role of Zohrot, the automatic and the um, uh, natural reaction will be uh, to be careful and uh, let us understand uh, who are these uh, guys and uh, what are their objectives and, uh, and, and goals. Uh, and of course, the question of normalization, we are also from our side very sensitive and very respective uh, to, uh, to this uh, topic. We don't want to force or even to disturb any uh, uh, activism of any Palestinian organization with the with any contact with Zohot, they are not sure that this contact will um, uh, help them, or if they think that this contact will disturb their uh, their, their their job. Um, um, so uh, I think we faced several times that uh, Palestinians, um, um, because they didn't know us, refused to. Uh, cooperate, and this was very natural. But uh, during the time when we sent the material and, of course, the principles of Zohrot, and they got to know uh, Zohrot as, um, uh, uh, of course, the, the, the Jewish colleagues in Zohrot as non-Zionist uh, uh, people, and they, they, they struggle against Zionism and against, against colonialism, and they demand decolonization of the, uh, of the whole uh, in, in, with the whole land and more than the land, as we said, the, the, even the knowledge and the perceptions, I think we got uh, a lot of uh, positive feedback of Palestinian organizations and, uh, and activists, and mainly, which is very, very exciting, the Palestinian refugees. We, um, in, in our role and in our position, as I said, in the in the Nakba land, inside the Green Line, we have this um, um, advantage um, to, to reach these places and to document what happened to the Palestinian destroyed places. We take photos and we can send them to the refugees that they don't have this access to these places. So I think in this meaning, we do this service for all uh, uh, refugees that are interested to get some information about what happened to these, uh, uh, to their homes or to their towns, we try, of course, to 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 do that. And uh, um, uh, in certain uh, projects, for many years, for example, we had a very good contact with Palestinian uh, organization in Bethlehem in, in the West Bank when we talked about the uh, 
a practical return. And we tried together, Palestinian organization, Palestinians from inside Israel, Jewish Israelis, all together to think about uh, or even uh, giving kind of uh, research or paper or advice or manifest how we see the future and how we see the implementation of the right to return. We saw that as a practical, we saw that as feasible, we saw that as possible, not only just a dream or a very far goal that no one will reach that. We tried for, I think, the last 10 years to push this uh, issue in order to make the right to return uh, as part of our work, not only to remember the past, but also to think about the future and to uh, give some ideas how the future could look like. Michael? I'm wondering if you have much support from maybe the liberal Zionist community in North America, for example, because I know that there are some groups that, uh, you know, anti-occupation groups say that will give some support to breaking the silence, Betzalem maybe, um, you know, there's a number of organizations. Uh, does any of Zokra support come from those sorts of groups or is maybe the right of return uh, a step too far? Uh, I'd be curious to know. I, um, yeah, I think it's definitely a step too far uh, for them. Uh, although the gradual change that I described within organizations like B'Tselem and Breaking the Silence uh, within the, the Israeli left, we are also seeing within Jewish organizations in uh, in North America. Um, I think it's mostly a generational change, um, but uh, still there's a long way to go. Uh, we don't get support as a general rule from liberal Zionists, um, from you know organizations like the uh, NIF and J Street. Um, Zohar tries to change that paradigm, and, and I think I'm. I'm connecting here to uh, Peter's next talk with the former ambassador um, of, of the two state solution. I mean, we don't necessarily advocate for one state or two states, we advocate for Palestinian return, uh, but we reject the, the logic of separation of that the, the only uh, solution is more fences, uh, more separation between populations and, and I can remind everyone that uh, Jews lived in Palestine uh, before Zionism and had and, and made communities and, and lived in good relations. Um, and they will live after Zionism. <laughs> and um, uh, with, with uh, Muslims and Christians and, and Druze and a whole lot of different communities that lived in, in Palestine. It was a very diverse uh, society, and they will live, inshallah, Omar, uh, we will live uh, after Zionism. Uh, I hope so. Um, I want this to happen, and uh, and that's what we're aiming at, but uh, I think it uh, mostly depends on what Israelis do today, and so far we haven't been doing very well in, in that respect as the oppression uh, keeps going and deepening and the Nakba is ongoing, uh, it doesn't incite a lot of trust uh, that all of these people uh, can live together, but um, I think this is what we have to work you, on. You face um, the kind of um, fierce oppression resistance from the Israeli government that, for example, made a number of those human rights organizations in the West Bank illegal, banned them and so on. What, what, I'm sure they don't like you, but um, what's the space that you operate in? Right, so um, so no, it's a, a completely different space. I mean, organizations in the West Bank are Palestinians and they operate under Israeli military rule. Um, we are very lucky and very privileged uh, to be working under the Israeli uh, pseudo-democratic uh, system. We are registered uh, in Israel. Um, so, of course, the government doesn't like us. Um, a lot of the public doesn't like us as well. Uh, the current government is trying to 
promote uh, some laws that will restrict our operations and, and other um, a whole host of, of uh, human rights organizations and then harm civil society, what's left of civil society in Israel uh, very significantly. Um, but of course, it's not comparable to uh, the difficulties that Palestinian human rights organizations uh, face. It's a completely different system. And that's, of course, is also part of, of Israeli apartheid. We, we don't live under the same system. Michael? There's an uh, interesting question from the audience about whether or not the right of return is practical. Um, I, I believe you have published some some reflections, some guidelines around that question. Can you uh, say a little bit about, I guess, the case for the practicality of, of right to return? Yeah, I <clears throat> yes, we published at least uh, two documents. Um, uh, one called Cape Town document. The other one is Jaffa document. And all are based on workshops that we did with ourselves and with Palestinian refugees, Palestinian IDPs, and- uh, uh, so What are IDPs? The, uh, internal displaced persons. What's, uh, that, what's that mean? Uh, it means, I don't know if you are aware, but 25% uh, of the Palestinians in Israel, citizens of the state of Israel are actually refugees. They are internal displaced from their original uh, village or town in 1948, but they found the shelter in other Palestinian uh, uh, village inside the Green Line, inside Israel. And they had uh, a kind of uh, solution by the Israeli authorities to stay in the uh, shelter uh, uh, village, but not to go back to their original one. So they became citizens of the state of Israel, but not in their original uh, village, and they uh, uh, considered as the inter in the international law as IDPs, internal displaced uh, people. Thank and uh, yeah, 25% uh, of the Palestinians in Israel are like, like in, in this position, in this status. And uh, we these workshops that uh, talked about the uh, the return, as I uh, mentioned before, to talk about how and uh, uh, if the um, the, um, the the return will take place. How uh, uh, this landscape, how the political situation, how the social, the cultural uh, situation will be changed. So we ask ourselves to give a kind of vision that includes the right to return, not to be afraid of it, not to be, consider that as a threat or an obstacle of the future. In the opposite way, we want to see it as a hope and as a, a, a motivation for the future, uh, the equal future and the peaceful future that we uh, try to build uh, over here. So we started with IDPs, as you see young uh, girls and boys, uh, uh, after they uh, learn about their original village or original place, they have tried to imagine the rebuilt village or to the or the life in their uh, in the new life in their uh, um, in, in, in their village, and they look at the conditions, the current conditions in their places. As I said, hundreds of villages are still under the title that possible to build them again, because the Israelis didn't build uh, uh, a Jewish community or Jewish city on the top of them. It's in, they are inside forests or parks or uh, open spaces or in military bases or milita military areas. So we can uh, dismantle these military or colonized places and uh, rebuild the villages again. And uh, it's, it's quite big number of refugees could be uh, uh, um, and return in their original places. But in the other cases that it's not possible really to go back to the exact place that your grandfather was expelled from, uh, we ask the people or the participants to give some ideas and they gave very creative ideas, including the refugees, the Palestinian refugees themselves, people that live in a refugee camp in Bethlehem or even in Lebanon that we met them in, in, in Europe. And they said, I can live in the closest place 
which is possible. Or after I got the acknowledgement of my right to that on that place, I can live in another city and can live in Jaffa or in Tiberias on another place. Uh, uh, all this paradigm of people living separately here inside Israel, uh, uh, um, even inside the state of Israel, Israel built about 1,000 towns and kibbutzes and villages for the Jews and zero for the Palestinians. The Palestinians remained in their ghettos, in their villages, um, very bad conditions and situation uh, uh, separately than the Jews. The, the approach here in Israel is to live separately. Who said that this is the normal way that people should live uh, in, in the future? It could be a mixture of people, of cultures, of uh, 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 religions, and people can live wherever they like to do. So they, they had uh, more solutions that they believed that before that they took part in these in these workshops. So I think the, the, the uh, I of course believe that the, the, the return is practical and feasible, uh, but to, to make this switch in our thoughts and our ideas, we should look at the return as a, 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 um, a changing point, we say, uh, um, from threat to hope, from obstacle, uh, to uh, uh, to possibility uh, for the future and not to be locked in the Israeli fears and the Israeli threats that return means um, new Holocaust, for example, this is one of the reactions uh, that we hear here among the Israelis. So I think in this way, we can really realize how uh, 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 the how, how return is really uh, uh, possible. And if you mentioned that, sorry, because I, this, is the la, this is the last slide. Uh, uh, next week, uh, here the State of Israel will um, celebrate the Independence Day. So we as Zohot, uh, in, this, in the same evening, we invite Israelis to have a very interesting evening, evening of um, uh, alternative uh, um, memorial events, talk with activists that are involved in resistance to the ongoing Nakba in the West Bank and inside the Green Line. And at the same day, the Palestinians in Israel, led by the IDP's association, uh, uh, organize a return march, which will be at the same day of the, the Independence Day of Israel. And we go to one of the destroyed Palestinian villages and we actually uh, commemorate the Nakba and demand for the implementation of return. And uh, this week, uh, uh, Peter, the uh, March return will be one of the villages that you are familiar with to a Lajun village that you visited in the past. And uh, next week we will be there in this big March. Amen. Excellent. And yeah, I, I believe I was there too last <laughs> few months okay. ago. And yeah, it's a really beautiful place. And uh, that sounds like an excellent event. Uh, and I'll just note that for those who are interested more in the sort of the, pr the practical question and a vision for return, there is some links have been put in into the webinar chat. Uh, I did want to ask uh, just about uh, where does your financial support come from? Are you mostly, um, does it mostly come through donors in, uh, in Israel or is it uh, internationally? Thank you for that question, Michael. Um, so uh, ideally we would love uh, all the support to come from uh, donors uh, in Israel. Practically most of it uh, comes from outside of Israel. Uh, again, being a paradigm changing organization, we don't have access uh, to much of the uh, funds that are available to more classical human rights organizations uh, like uh, EU uh, funds, uh, other uh, government, uh, USAID, we, uh, we are not funded by any of these, uh, of these bodies. Uh, we are funded by private and uh, some church foundations and by many private individuals, uh, both uh, Israelis and from all over the world who uh, value our work and want it uh, to, to continue. Um, our budget is pretty small. Uh, we are 16 members 
uh, doing the work of 20 team members. I, I can go <laughs> on and on and, and, and praise my, um, my team uh, because they are so wonderful. Um, but I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, and you, you got a taste of uh, what Omar uh, is doing. And uh, if any of you ever come uh, or come again to Palestine, I highly, highly recommend that you take a tour uh, with Omar and, and get the experience of uh, what the Nakba was and is uh, and, and what those destroyed places mean uh, for Palestinians and to all of our futures. Um, so uh, this is the funding uh, that we have. Uh, but, but Rachel, I, I've, been to, I've, I've been to I've I've been to several with tours. Small with, budgets. I did, you do mm -hmm. you do great tours. Uh, seems to me you got enough money. Why do you need more money? Why are you on a <laughs> Why are you on a um, fund, funding campaign? That, what would you do with the more money? What do you need it for? Okay, um, so of course, like all, all organizations, uh, we fundraise uh, all the time. We're always uh, short. Uh, we need the money uh, to offer tours to more and more people uh, to continue working on curriculums. And uh, by the way, I put the curriculum in the chat as well uh, that you can look at. Uh, we, we publish teaching materials, uh, tools for activists. We hold workshops. Uh, we have our website, which is one of the largest archives in three languages of the Nakba and archive of, uh, of testimonies. Um, we do research that result in the mapping that Omar showed you uh, and the wonderful app, I return. Um, that of course it's quite costly to maintain, but it's a wonderful tool that uh, everyone can take this hidden map of, of the erased history of this place in uh, her or his packet uh, and look at it everywhere. Um, we, uh, we do art exhibitions and we show movies and most of the budget, and that's maybe a bit untraditional uh, to say at a fundraiser, but the court doesn't do things in that traditional way. Uh, most of the budget goes uh, to the team's uh, salary, again, doing wonderful work. Uh, half the team is Israelis and the other half is Palestinians. And uh, we want them to keep doing uh, that work that they've been doing for 21 years. Um, and do it until return, Palestinian return is realized and uh, until uh, a different society and different politics uh, can emerge here. And uh, I think now more than ever, uh, it's crucial that this work is, is being done and, and done well uh, and done consistently. So what has been very consistent. Uh, when we were very small and where, when we became a bit larger and, and got the ears of more people, uh, but we are consistent in our message. So thank you oh. for this question. Oh, well, thank you. And Michael, you got a last question. We're running out of time here. We want to wind up shortly, but do you have a, a last question you wanted to get in or pick one up from the Q&A? I saw, actually, while Michael's looking there, I saw there was a personal question for you, Rachel. Like, how did you personally get involved in this? It's like, it, um, Omar's interest in it is sort of more obvious to an outsider. Yours is less obvious. So how did you get interested? Well, <laughs> I, I think it's very obvious, <laughs> um, not to me at least, uh, that, you know, um, I, I live here <laughs> and, um, I want this place to get better. I'm very invested in it. Uh, but how I got involved is a pretty long um, winding road that made me, uh, like most Israelis, uh, I have a very Zionist upbringing. I didn't know anything about the Nakba growing up. Uh, I was uh, seeing remains of, of Palestinian houses in the fields around where uh, I grew up and I never knew what they were. I, I thought they were some old remains from, I don't know, the Roman Empire or something like that. Uh, 
Um, and it's unfortunately grow up here. Um, and when I started hearing from Palestinians and um, I think at some point, if, if you start connecting the dots, you can't stop. Yeah. Uh, you just see everything different. And I think it involved a lot of, um, you know, um, rage and, and grief on uh, how much I was lied to by my parents, by my educators, uh, whom I appreciate and love. Uh, but they never told me the truth. And I think we should know the truth uh, about uh, our own histories, about where, where we live. Um, I guess people who live in North America can relate. Um, and I think Zohrot, or not so much Zohrot, but Palestinian liberation, offers a, a path to our liberation as well. Mm. And the more I know about the Nakba, the more I train myself to uh, see the landscape I'm familiar with and that I grew up in, uh, in different eyes uh, and see it as a Palestinian space and as a space to return, I feel more liberated and, and I feel um, maybe paradoxically uh, more and more that I belong here, or hmm. that, that I can belong here hmm. if, if we do that right. That there can be a place here for me, not as an occupier, uh, not as a colonizer, but as someone who belongs here like everybody else. Thanks for sharing that, Rachel. Michael, you got a last question you want to ask, and then we'll move to winding up. No, that that's fine. I think uh, all my burning questions were satisfied. So, well, look, we've reached our time. Um, I will um, be following up this with a an email to all the people who registered for this. It will have a link to the to Zohot, its website, to the donations page, and so on. Um, um, I want to say on behalf of the Ottawa Forum uh, to give my great for admiration for the difficult work that um, Zohot has been carrying out. I once had a tour with Aitan Bronstein many, many years ago to Canada Park. That was my first. And my understanding is that he's coming to Canada, he's trying to plan a, a tour to Canada this fall, which I think would be terrific if that would. He was, one, he was the founder, I believe, of Zohot. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed uh, meeting both uh, Omar and Rachel in person. I really appreciate Omar, you're taking some time off as you get to the end of Ramadan. Uh, Rachel, Passover is just over. Uh, Michael, you're passing up a sunny, sunny, warm spring day in Ottawa, uh, as are all the people who are on the call. So thank you so much for, uh, for all of you for the collaboration today. Have a great day. Thank you very much. You too. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks a lot.